March 13, 1962. Lyman Lemnitzer, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, presents a proposal to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara named Operation Northwoods. The document proposed staging terrorist attacks in and around Guantanamo Bay to provide a pretext for military intervention in Cuba. The plans included starting rumors about Cuba using clandestine radio, landing friendly Cubans inside the base to stage attacks, starting riots at the main gate, blowing up ammunition inside the base, starting fires, sabotaging aircraft and ships on the base, bombing the base with mortar shells, sinking a ship outside the entrance, staging funerals for mock victims, staging a terror campaign in Miami, Florida and Washington, D.C., and finally, destroying a drone aircraft over Cuban waters. The passengers, federal agents in reality, would allegedly be college students on vacation a plane at Eglin Air Force Base would be painted and numbered as a duplicate of a registered civil aircraft belonging to a CIA front in Miami. The duplicate would be substituted for the real plane and loaded with the passengers. The real plane would be converted into a drone. The two planes would rendezvous south of Florida. The passenger-laden plane would land at Eglin Air Force Base to evacuate its passengers and return to its original status. The drone would pick up the scheduled flight plan and, over Cuban waters, transmit a mayday signal before being blown up by remote control. The plan is rejected by McNamara, and President John F. Kennedy personally removes Lemnitzer as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. December 1st, 1984. A remote-controlled Boeing 720 takes off from Edwards Air Force Base and is crash-landed by NASA for fuel research. Before its destruction, the plane flew a total of 16 hours and 22 minutes, including 10 takeoffs, 69 approaches, and 13 landings. August 1997. The cover of FEMA's Emergency Response to Terrorism depicts the World Trade Center in crosshairs. February 28, 1998. The Global Hawk, Raytheon's unmanned aircraft vehicle, completes its first flight over Edwards Air Force Base in California at an altitude of 32,000 feet, cruising altitude for a commercial jetliner. 1999. NORAD begins conducting exercises in which hijacked airliners are flown into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. June 2000. The Department of Justice releases the terrorism manual with the World Trade Center in crosshairs. September 2000. The project for a new American century, a neoconservative think tank whose members include Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Jeb Bush, and Paul Wolfowitz, releases their report, entitled Rebuilding America's Defenses. In it, they declare that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. October 24, 2000. The Pentagon conducts the first of two training exercises called MASCAL, which simulate a Boeing 757 crashing into the building. Charles Burlingame, an ex-Navy F-4 pilot who worked in the Pentagon, participates in this exercise before retiring to take a job at American Airlines where, less than a year later, his Boeing 757 allegedly crashes into the building. April 2001. NORAD plans an exercise in which a plane is flown into the Pentagon, but is rejected as too unrealistic. June 2001. The Department of Defense initiates new instructions for military intervention in the case of a hijacking. It states that for all non-immediate responses, the Department of Defense must get permission directly from the Secretary of Defense. Attorney General John Ashcroft begins flying on chartered jets for the remainder of his term due to a threat assessment by the FBI. July 4, 2001. Osama bin Laden, wanted by the United States since 1998, receives medical attention at the American Hospital in Dubai, where he is visited by a local chief of the CIA. July 24, 2001. Larry A. Silverstein, who already owned World Trade Center 7, signs a $3.2 billion, 99-year lease on the entire World Trade Center complex six weeks before 9-11. Included in the lease is a $3.5 billion insurance policy, specifically covering acts of terrorism. September 6, 2001, 3,150 put options are placed on United Airlines stock. A put option is a bet that a stock will fall. That day, put options were more than four times its daily average. Bomb-sniffing dogs are pulled from the World Trade Center, and security guards end two weeks of 12-hour shifts. September 7, 2001. 
27,294 put options are placed on Boeing's stock, more than five times the daily average. September 10th, 2001. 4,516 put options are placed on American Airlines, almost 11 times its daily average. Newsweek reports that a number of top Pentagon brass canceled their flight plans for the next morning. San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown receives a phone call warning him not to fly the next morning. Pacifica Radio later reveals that this phone call came directly from National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. And in Pakistan, at a military hospital, all of the urologists are replaced by a special team in order to host their guest of honor, Osama bin Laden, who is carefully escorted inside to be watched carefully and looked after. September 11th, 2001. The National Reconnaissance Office in Chantilly, Virginia, is preparing for an exercise in which a small corporate jet crashes into their building. NORAD is in the middle of a number of military exercises. The first, Vigilant Guardian, is described as an exercise that would pose an imaginary crisis to North American air defense outposts nationwide. The second, Northern Vigilance, moved fighter jets to Canada and Alaska to fight off an imaginary Russian fleet. Three F-16s from Washington, D.C.'s National Guard at Andrews Air Force Base 15 miles from the Pentagon are flown 180 nautical miles away for a training mission in North Carolina. This left 14 fighter jets to protect the entire United States. Hi, Boston Center Team U. We have a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise, not a test. Uh, do we want to think about uh, scrambling aircraft? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, that's a decision somebody's going to have to make probably in the next 10 minutes. Uh, you know, everybody just left the room. The, the first question I have is basically to get from you a, a sense of how you would rate the American media in their coverage of the events of the attack last September. Well, let's see. Uh... Shamefully is a word that comes to mind. This, Justin, you are looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. But overall, the uh, American journalism was cowed and intimidated by the, uh, this uh, massive flag sucking, this uh, patriotic orgy. You know, if you criticize the president, it's unpatriotic, and there's something wrong with you, you may be a terrorist. So, so in that sense, Hunter S. Thompson, there's, there's not enough room for dissenting voices? Well, there's plenty of room. Uh, there's not enough people are willing to take the risk. Jim, I, I don't know whether we've confirmed that this was an aircraft, or to be more specific, some people said they thought they saw a missile. There was definitely a blue logo with like a circular logo on the front of the plane. Um, it definitely did not look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the side. Mark, if what you say is true, those could be cargo planes. You said you didn't see any windows in the side? I didn't see any windows on the side. It was, it, it was not a normal flight that I've ever seen at an airport. It was a plane that had a blue uh, logo on the front and it just it did not look like it belonged in this area. It's just sort of a, uh, a herd mentality, a lemming-like mentality. If you don't go with the flow, you're anti-American, therefore a suspect. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now, raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way! You sort of wonder when something like that happens, well, who stands to benefit? You know, who had the opportunity and the motive? 
You just gotta look at these basic things. I don't assume that, that I know the truth about what uh, went on that day. And yeah, I just look around and looking for well, who had the motive, who had the opportunity, who had the uh, equipment, who had the, uh, had the will. I put enough time on the inside of, well, the White House and the you know, campaigns, and I, I've known enough for the people who do these things to know that the public version of the news, what I'm convinced, is never really what happened. And these people, I think, are willing to take that even further. seems a very long bow to me, but are, are you sort of suggesting that, that this worked in the favour of the Bush administration? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Arlington, Virginia. Hani Hanyor allegedly executes a 330 degree turn at 530 miles per hour, descending 7,000 feet in two and a half minutes to crash American Airlines Flight 77 into the ground floor of the Pentagon. final approach took it directly across Interstate 395. Knocking white poles out of the ground and bouncing off of the lawn before impact. First, let's meet Hani Hanyor. Hanyor had come to Freeway Airport in Bowie, Maryland one month earlier seeking to rent a small plane. However, when Hanyor went on three test runs in the second week of August, he had trouble controlling and landing a single-engine Cessna 172. Oh, well, my name is Marcel Bernard, and I'm the chief flight instructor here at Freeway. Hani Hanjour. Well, basically, what happened with him 